Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Chit Heads. Today's esteemed guest, Stephen Porges, will be offering a course at Embodied Philosophy beginning Wednesday, October 6th, and the course is called Polyvagal Theory, Neural Exercises for Safety and Social Connection. That course goes for four weeks, and if you're listening to this before October 6, 2021, you can register for the live course, or if you're listening to this after, you can also register for the course on demand if you just go to our website, embodiedphilosophy.com, click on Courses in the navigation, and just scroll down slightly and you'll see the course there, Polyvagal Theory, Neural Exercises for Safety and Connection. Today's interview with Stephen is actually extracted from a online conference that we did a couple of years ago called Tracing Trauma. And so you'll notice that a lot of the questions that I asked Stephen have to do with the relationship between polyvagal theory and trauma. And if you're interested in exploring any of the other lectures from that conference, you can actually see all of them with a premium or unlimited membership because all of those lectures are currently on EPTV. And if you want to explore membership options, you can just head to embodiedphilosophy.com. All right, I hope you enjoy the interview. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tracing Trauma online conference. I'm here with Dr. Stephen Porges, and today we're going to talk about his paradigm-shifting work on the polyvagal theory as it relates to trauma. So hello, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Jacob. Thank you for inviting me to participate. So many of those who are listening or watching will be familiar with our interview that we did for the previous conference, the Embodied Brain online conference. Um, but for those that are tuning in for the first time, I'd love to just cover some of the basics to get people situated in relation to your work. So let's start by talking about the vagus nerve. What is the vagus nerve and why should we care about it? Well, the vagus nerve connects our brain to many of the organs in our body, but it connects it in a bi-directional manner. And recently there's been a lot of interest in the vagus and vagal stimulation and when you're talking about vagal nerve stimulation, which is very, very useful in many disorders, you're talking about stimulating sensory information that's going through the vagus to the brain. Now, our organs are always sending information through the vagus to the brain. In fact, 80% of the fibers, the nerves in the actual vagus, which functions like a conduit, are actually carrying information from the body to the brain. But the brain then processes that information and conveys it back down to these organs. Think of the vagus as being part of a major surveillance system and think of the brainstem as taking that information and trying to optimize the regulation of your organs. Now, within polyvagal theory, this becomes important because we really have two different uh, historic or evolutionary branches of the vagus. One that occurred very early in vertebrate evolution and that part of the vagus actually has when it's used in defense slows us up basically shuts us down and the newer vagus is actually uh, it moved to a different part of the brainstem and it's got a link to the face the nerves that regulate the muscles of our face and head the other cranial nerves that would be involved in social behavior so social behavior ingestion vocalization uh, are all, in a sense, neural exercises of the vagus. Mm. Now, uh, I want to go back to that, what you mentioned, in this sort of developmental uh, sequence, because um, if I'm correct, this is the, you're speaking of the reptilian kind of stage of development to the mammalian, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That there's, can you talk a little bit about that in relation to those two stages? Sure. That during our uh, embryology, which kind of parallels in part our, our phylogenetic history, meaning our evolutionary history, um, the last part of our autonomic nervous system, the last part of the brain's regulation of visceral organs is really a newer myelinated vagal system. But that doesn't what myelinated. Start... What does myelinated mean? Oh, it's coating of the nerve with a fatty substance that, oh. think of it as a coaxial cable. Okay. So you have an insulator around the nerve, so the nerve can be uh, tra convey information uh, faster, it can convey more information, um, and it just enables that 
part of the vagal system to be very, very specific and to react in milliseconds and very, very specifically. Hmm. So, the, the, so this was, de this developed sort of in response to evolutionary needs. What were those needs? Well, you see, we, 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 you know, when we started, uh, when we speculate on those levels, yeah. we assume we know. Um, the, it, basically, uh, the simplest answer to it is that when mammals start to evolve, uh, they were dependent upon nurturing, they had to uh, signal, they had to suck, swallow, and breathe, they had to be taken care of. Connectedness and safety became major uh, determinants of survival for, uh, for mammals because they were not able to take care of themselves as opposed to reptiles that hatched uh, from an egg and then scampered off and did whatever they were supposed to do. Mammals were basically very dependent. Now, the pressures that resulted in this is very, they're very hard to identify. I, I like having kind of fun talking about this because as uh, the, another major defining feature of a mammal is not really they have this uh, shifted regulation of the heart and visceral organs, with a branch of the vagus that's linked to the nerves of the face and head, they also have detached middle ear bones. Now, that's a factoid that will basically get you nothing except some smiles at dinner. So you, you talk about that and you say, well, this is an interesting issue because what does that buy you? That buys you the, the capacity to communicate in a frequency band that reptiles couldn't hear because their middle ear bones were still part of their jawbone. So lower frequencies were detected by easily by reptiles, but the higher frequencies that mammals use for social communication and signaling were out of the uh, dominant range. So that became an important part of adaptation. But another interesting part of that is when the bones broke off, it enabled the cortex to expand. So we have large cortex or cortices. However, one could argue in the other way that as the cortex expanded, the middle ear bones broke off. So we don't know what was the antecedent, but the issue of certain features define the transition from reptile or ancient extinct reptiles to ancient extinct mammals. And those features are really about cueing, social communication, uh, the ability to connect, the ability to signal safety in another, and the ability literally to be uh, immobile and safe, not immobile in the state of fear. So mm. if you think about our visions of an ideal life, we want to be able to be uh, in the arms of another person. The term I like to use is in the arms of another appropriate mammal, because some people enjoy being with their pets. But if you watch people with their dogs, sometimes they have a better sense of intimacy, of shared moments with their pets than they have with people because people yeah. bring cues of danger to them. Yeah. And seemingly more so, it seems. Yeah. Um, so where does the, there, something interesting that I've heard a bit about is this thing called the negativity bias. And I'm wondering where this kind of comes in, where, um, at least as far as I understand it, um, you know, evolutionarily, we, mm -hmm. while we did have these sort of, you know, the social engagement system we also had the you know the need to yeah. to to make ourselves safe and secure and therefore but but once we've evolved to a place where those kinds of dangers are not as um are not as present there is still a bias toward this kind of fight or flight mentality that we that okay. actually the only so, we, yeah. we can have fun we can unpack this Okay. Because you're using words like mentality, which implies intentionality or right. cognition, the decision. Let's think a little differently. Let's say if I'm in one physiological state, I have a negative bias. I'm more hypervigilant. I'm prepared to fight and to flee. But if I'm in another physiological state that has been literally cued by cues of safety, just visualize a, a baby coming down when the mother is modulating her voice or singing a lullaby, that, that baby's body, that nervous system is shifting the bias. Right. So the detection of, of danger or risk in the environment, danger, safety, or life threat, is through a process that I've articulated as being something I call neuroception. Yeah. Because I want to get this construct 
safely away from the world of perception. Because if it stayed in the world of perception and people were hurt, let's say by a perpetrator or attack, they would start blaming themselves that they didn't interpret, they didn't detect. Yeah. Um, so we, part of when we start talking about embodied processes, it's this awareness to understand what we used to call intuition, but may really be linked to specific cues that people are clearly bombarding us with uh, in the way that they talk, in the way their gestures, not necessarily in their words. So our bodies are much more responsive to the intonation of voice, the gestures, and less responsive to the actual content. Right. And so, the, and this point of neuroception is really meant to, um, to kind of uh, uh, appeal to the idea that, you know, everything is sort of a top-down processing, that we can sort of regulate ourselves yeah. by thinking differently, you know, that, that yeah. horrible book, The Seek that implies, you know, everything just needs to be imagined differently and we'll solve all of our problems and manifest our wildest dreams. But, but neuroception is essentially this, this operation that's taking place below the threshold of our conscious mind and, and, and conditioning um, yeah. the possibility of any thought whatsoever, right? Right. So the, the, there are two parts to what you said. It's below consciousness, but it's using higher level brain structures that make executive decisions. Mm. So you're walking across the street and you hear a car hitting the brakes. You move before you're aware of what it is. Your reaction is quick. You call it startle. But your body has made a decision to get out of the way quickly. Then you become aware of what it is. But even before you become aware of what it is, you become aware of your bodily shift. Mm -hmm. So we are, in a sense, astutely aware of our visceral changes in our body. And that's coming up the vagus, or a lot of it's coming up the vagus. And that creates a bias in our perceptual world, because we now have shifted our physiological state. And now if our body is mobilized and hypervigilant, we are more likely to see cues of danger in the environment when there are no cues. And that's functionally adaptive because if we saw cues that were neutral and we saw them as positive, that might be okay. But if the cue was slightly on the negative side and we missed it, we'd be a dead camper. And the real interesting part is if we think about it, if we place so much uh, value in our cognitive decision making, if we were to evaluate cues to determine whether they were dangerous or not, or life-threatening or not, the species would have long disappeared because we'd be in these internal dialogues of, is it safe, is it not safe, how this, you know, we'd go into this uh, gradation of trying to scale it. And when you talk to people who have been abducted, uh, you know, kidnapped or, or these issues, they often say that, you know, they had feelings, but they overrode those feelings because everything seemed to be in place. They went through a dialogue internally. And um, so they just, you know, overrode their negative bias. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the, actually, I, I, want, I want to interrupt on one point, and that is when people have been injured, which we're going to move into trauma questions. Mm -hmm. um, Trauma resets that bias, resets by, it changes physiological state and facilitates a physiological state that will support fight, flight, or even deafen, disappearing. Um, so the body, rather than interpreting things as cues of social engagement, will have a negative bias to get defensive. And this can happen with, you know, a person who's had a severe complex trauma history if you as a stranger engage them, make direct eye contact, and start to talk to them in a very melodic way, they might feel okay for a couple of seconds, and then their body will clamp down, will react, and it's really going into those associations. The body remembered. You may not consciously remember it, but it's conditioned into your body that trusting is now a trigger of being injured. Ah, wow. Okay, so a lot of stuff there, but let's kind of, uh, uh, let's set up by going back then to, um, uh, I, I guess I want to talk about um, just generally what kind of uh, common mind-body syndromes 
might be related to, um, you know, what might be relevant to polyvagal theory. Okay, can you, I'm going to throw it back. Can you get a little more specific? Can you lead me along this path? So, um, are you asking what types of symptomatology uh, could be explained by a polyvagal theory? Yes, kind of? yes. Exactly. Okay, yes. so if we, if we focus on the world of either mental health or within mental health on trauma histories, we see the manifestations in the neuroregulation of our physiology. So we see that we talk about anxiety disorders. Uh, what is that really saying? That you know, people say that's hyper aroused, hyper vigilant. But from a polyvagal perspective, there's a down regulation of this newer mammalian vagus and the neuroregulation of all the muscles of the face and head. So the people who are highly anxious, their faces will be flat. They they will have difficulty hearing human voice in background sounds, uh, their voices uh, will be uh, narrow frequency band and often high, and they will then also have gut problems because they pulled off the vagal system and they have mobilized. And when you mobilize, what do you do to homeostatic processes? You put a clamp on it. So the features in the gut will be gut problems and you know, other problems associated with that. If they have had severe re shutdown responses, uh, then you start getting even a different uh, topography, a different portfolio, because they may be mobilized as a way of keeping them from shutting down. Because polyvagal theory said, it tells you that there's a hierarchy of how these systems work. And if you don't have access to that social engagement safety system, you're now prone to danger and reactivity and, and responding to life threat. So in a sense, your autonomic nervous system is co-opted, not for homeostatic processes and not for in a sense, good bodily feelings, but for defense. And so when you recruit that last system, and this is what many of the listeners may be aware of, when you have reacted to a traumatic event. Now, trauma is not an event in my vocabulary. Trauma is the response. So it, it, so it means that Individually, we react. The event, for some people, they may be resilient and walk through. Right. But for other individuals, they'll have an amazing retuning of autonomic function. And that gets manifested in many of the symptoms that now are labeled medically uh, unexplained symptoms and use, uh, such as irritable bowel syndrome, dysautonomia, fibromyalgia, basically diagnostics that are used by physicians when they don't know what to, to do. <laughs> and, and, and the world, like irritable bowel, affects a large number of people. And, and it's being treated in medicine as if it's an end organ dysfunction. Yeah. Now, it's not an end organ. You know, I'm not saying it's not for everyone. But for most people, it's a neural uh, derived. It's a neural functioning derived disorder. And it's predictable. So if someone has severe trauma history, irritable bowel becomes a comorbid feature that most clinicians will acknowledge. Mm. I wish you had been around when I was a child because I had IBS myself and, and uh, no one ever said anything about the traumatic environment that probably did induce that. So yeah. it's, it's important observation. So part of our journey, and this is shared journey uh, amongst those of us who are working the area, and those of us who have had experiences, or let's say experiences of trauma. This is a journey of kind of rediscovering who we are, rediscovering our body, and, and again, respecting what the body can do, and not being, in a sense, not creating a hostile environment in which we are angry at our body for having irritable bowel syndrome, for yeah. all these various issues, but in understanding and seeing it in a different context. And this is really what I think, uh, I would say, what I think the important uh, contribution of polyvagal theory is. It decontextualizes the disorder from a disorder to a functional adaptive reaction that had some benefit at some point in our uh, lifespan. The issue is, once it's had that response, how do we retune it? How do we coax the nervous system into feeling safe? We certainly don't coax it into feeling safe by criticizing it and saying, it's your problem, take medicine. 
Uh, we need to get the body into states in which it can regulate and feel more comfortable with itself. The other attribute, of course, is so-called body numbness. And these are predictable features of trauma. And we need to, in a sense, communicate to people that these are predictable from the adaptive sequence of the responses. So I have a question kind of about the effects of trauma on the autonomic nervous system. And I guess what I'm specifically interested in is, is what are the conditions, you know, you're talking about how some physiologies may experience that traumatic stimulus or what would be a traumatic stimulus differently than another. So what, what, is, the, what is the condition of the autonomic nervous system such that it would receive an event traumatically versus another autonomic nervous system. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, you're asking why are some people resilient and some aren't? Or yeah. why are some unresilient at one point in time and not another? Yeah. And part of it, I would say there are two vectors or two pathways to try to explain that. One is the existing physiological state of the individual at the time of the event. And the second is you know, I, actually there are probably three, and the other one is more, more of a genetic uh, predisposition because the reactions to traumatic events vary from people fighting and fleeing to shutting down. And if you think about species survival, it's good to have both mm -hmm. uh, within your population based upon what's going to happen. So we know we have some diversity of propensity and the third part we've also touched a little on is history and association, what we've learned. Uh, my focus is really, if I can measure the physiological state of the individual, what information do I have to change those probabilities? So my strategy has been that interventions have all, you know, I should say all, many interventions have started at the wrong point. They started at the outcome or the behavior. And I think they should start at the neural regulation of the autonomic nervous system and think of the behaviors that come from different physiological states as functionally being emergent properties. So if we change our physiological state, does that state support social behavior, safety, reciprocity, having fun, enjoying life, or even being spiritual or appreciating aesthetics? While another physiological state is just fine if you're going to go into, into battle. And another one is, what if you're locked into a house and there's um, you know, bombs flying overhead, like the, when people were in London? You know, what is the best, most adaptive physiological shift your body should go into? And there'll be a distribution of that. However, if the social engagement system, that new mile in Vegas is working, it enables those other attributes in the autonomic nervous system to support homeostatic function. So in a sense, if we can get that on board, we can retune and optimize the human experience for many. Mm. So can you just give an example for maybe some that aren't familiar with, you know, the idea of starting at the behavior versus starting at, you know, cultivating the nervous system in yeah. some way? What would be an example of that? Well, the example would be behavior modifications or uh, even cognitive behavioral therapies. Okay. Uh, they, these things are useful. I'm not saying they're not useful, but the efficiency is if the person were in a, quote, safer physiological state, the therapies that are behavior oriented could work more efficiently. Mm. So it's the idea is in one model, you're basically dealing with an SR, stimulus response, input, output, the human as a machine. And that's really what we, uh, so much of practice, whether it's medicine or psychology, uh, is invested in the input-output model. The polyvagal theory says there's something in between the input and the output, and that's the state of the organism. And we have to, in a sense, literally feed the state of the organism to optimize its capacity to take shocks, to be resilient. And then it can process inputs and outputs more selectively and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the practices or tools that are shifting the state of the organism or feeding the state of the organism, as you said? Well, given your interests, so the issues would be... Uh, 
vocalizations or chanting, singing, uh, meditation, which if meditation deals with breathing as its, as its initial practice, how we learn to breathe, if we extend the duration of exhalations, if we start using abdominal breathing, those strategies change how the vagus works. So as you extend duration of exhalation, the vagus becomes more impactful. It starts to downregulate our defenses. So a slow exhalation uh, starts turning off defenses and shifting a negative bias to a positive one. Mm. And when we sing, it's just like a, a breathing exercise because it's a slow exhalation. If we play a wind instrument, it's the same thing, slow exhalation. And what we are learning also is that it is as focused listening. If we listen in a room that is quiet, if we listen to the modulation of like a mother's voice, that also recruits, it becomes a neural exercise of the system. And listening can function like an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator if you have the right context and the right characteristics. Mm -hmm. Think of the toddler who's crying and the mother starts to smile and to sing to the baby and suddenly the baby's tears disappear and the baby relaxes and is no longer in a tantrum. Mm. So um, I, I have two questions sort of related to this. One is, um, does polyvagal theory have anything to say about kind of generational mm. trauma or trauma that pre-existed ones, you know, this particular lifetime and, and grandparents or parents? And then the follow-up question to that would be, well, actually, I'll, I'll let you answer that and then I'll ask this. Oh, okay, so what we would call transgenerational reenactments or transgenerational traumas are very complex because the environment that you grow up with, with your parents, is greatly impacted by the experiences that their parents had. And they start conveying that. So whether it's a fear of certain things or an approach to the world, pessimism, um, it gets conveyed. And the real issue is think about, think about it. Do you, in your memories of being a child, feel that you were chronically being evaluated? Is this degree of evaluation, um, and did you see that as impacting on who you were, as opposed to telling you more about who they were? So a, a, as we get older, we, we realize that, hey, most of this is coming from someone else's mouth has nothing to do with us, has to do with how other people feel in this world, whether they're our parents, grandparents, teachers, or, or friends and spouses. Um, there, it's not merely a clear truthful, it's truthful with their own bias, but this reenactment is an extraordinarily uh, powerful scenario. Uh, there's a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful book, but it's very, you know, it's, it's heartfelt and hurts to read. It's a book about uh, women who were abused as children, how they function as parents. Mm. And basically, they start getting into the same reenactments. And yeah. it's like, here's the group that wants so desperately to break the cycle. And their vulnerabilities are great. So their vulnerabilities to be defensive, to be abusive in their own way are there, and also to be vulnerable to other uh, predation so they can get hurt again. Yeah. Uh, it's because their systems are not reading the world in the same way that a resilient person would. Mm. So then that segues actually nicely into the ne my next question, which is um, what are the kind of symptomatologies that arise out of, if that's the correct use of the word, because I'm uh, <laughs> doing my best, uh, that arise out of um, the, a, a baby's experience not hearing mother ease or not having that prosodic tone um, you know, present throughout their, their early wow. development. Well, here, here's the interesting part. Um, most children uh, have at least moments of feeling safe that they can carry with them. They have an idealized one. The ones that have the most vulnerability are, of course, those that don't. Mm -hmm. And many of them end up in foster care because they're taken away from their biological parents. And this becomes a very important target of treatment, a target of a population of where the child cannot be 
uh, managed in the way that we would uh, tend to, or historically have managed kids. And that was through behavior, through rewards, through punishments, through threats, but has to now be managed through uh, isolated moments of trust. So that, and this becomes the real difficult one. And, and this is really where therapies have to move and they are moving. They're beginning to pick up that the work that's done in therapy is very efficient when they are these moments that are often they're called like therapeutic presence or shared moments. But those are the moments when the autonomic nervous system of the client is interacting with the physiology of the therapist and they now have this moment of communication. And those moments now have to be cherished and remembered. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about how, um, you know, there would be maybe a shift from the behavior centered approach to, um, you know, feeding the state of the organism. But I'm, I'm curious what else, how else polyvagal theory is, is kind of informing or transforming uh, trauma care and approaches to trauma? Well, for, there are a couple important points. Um, one, it, it makes the, the first point is that the individual who's experienced trauma needs to be respected for his or her experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's this issue of, of being present with the survivor and respecting their experience, not in pontificating, not in getting into uh, litigious types of behaviors of, of retribution, but understanding in a way of what human beings mean when they say, I need to be understood. They need someone there that will be in sense support, not evaluative, not trying to give them the way to go, but they are with them. So the first thing is the respect for the body. And as we do that, that creates cues of safety in the interaction. Then the top-down features of understanding the bottom-up cues, and I, this is basically jargon, but really when you have a trauma history, there's a percolation of bodily feelings that are going up and also the memories of those feelings under the traumatic event. When we start having an understanding of those responses as having a function, as having a sense trying to protect us, either through getting us into rage or mobilization or passing out or trying to disappear or dissociating, then we start gaining respect for what our body has done. And so we start going first, respect the individual's experience, then through a psychoeducational model, provide the client, provide the individual with the understanding that these physiological reactions and these behaviors are quite predictable, but have a function. And in all cases, those functions have been very positive in saving the life of the individual. So we have to, in a sense, treat ourselves in a more heroic, with a more heroic narrative. We need to shift the narrative from, I need to get better, I need to fight this, it got to be tough. Even when we get to things like cancer, when we talk about got to fight cancer, yeah. I even wonder whether that is the appropriate metaphor. It's not like cancer kill me, but it's cancer as part of me now, how do I deal with that? So it becomes a different model of how we view our bodily reactions. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, uh, Stephen, I, when I was uh, initially, you know, preparing, I reached out to our, um, our the Facebook group that's a part of our community, and I asked um, them if they had any questions for you. <laughs> so, um, a, a couple of things came up that I thought were that were sort of interesting, um, which is. Um, what is happening in the auto, just sort of, I guess, this is kind of just getting clarifying, clarifying terms, and I had this confusion as well, I think, when I was reading your work. What is happening in the autonomic nervous system when, the, when a human is in a freeze response as compared to feign death? Oh, well, it, this, this is a good question because there's gradations. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the actual polyvagal theory really emphasized uh, a more of the collapse, the loss of muscle tone, which is part of the death fading response, visualize the mouse in the jaws of the cat. Yeah. But that's not really the whole story. There's a gradation, and the gradation actually has 
high muscle tension plus a kind of a dissociated feature. So the person will go like that. And, and that is recruiting some of the sympathetic. So if we thought of this as a continuum of adaptive reaction, one is a hybrid where there's a sympathetic tone to it, and one is loss of sympathetics, which means you're totally gone. So it, it, there's a gradation. Now remember, to have muscle tension, uh, you have to recruit sympathetic activity. Mm. And that becomes your defining feature. Uh, when the muscles lose their tone, then they are truly in this, would be called a more dorsal vagal, the old vagal circuit, in which we would just shut down. So that would be feigned death, is when there's feigned no muscle tone. Right, and also, you know, when there's no muscle tone, often people will just pass out. Right. So, you know, vasovagal syncope, fainting, so that's the medical term. But fainting is part of it. And also, often people lose muscle tone as they start to faint. You know, they just get rubbery, rubbery legs and they keel over. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the follow-up but questions to this or related questions is that um, someone is curious when a person is stuck in a freeze response, um, but is you know still needing to function in the world. Um, what are the kind of methods based on you know the polyvagal theory that would help a person in that instance release a freeze response? Well, uh, when in that mode, there are traumatologists, people working on that, and you know it's part of the the training. I think in somatic experiencing as one of the focal points, but. From a polyvagal perspective, part of the answer would come in, how can you downregulate those sympathetics at that moment? Uh, because that freeze response, not the passing out, but the tightening of the muscles, might be uh, approachable through breathing exercises, mm -hmm. through slow exhalations. So a lot of people are bringing uh, breathing into their training as a resource. So if a person understands they can now shift how they breathe as a resource to kind of buffer that. Uh, in, in somatic experiencing, they also do uh, vu sounds, their chant sounds, which are slow exhalations. And if you think of that within the uh, context of pranayama yoga, what they're doing is exhaling slowly, but they're also creating vibrations and movements of the laryngeal and pharyngeal areas, which are have also major afferents uh, and efferents that are linked to the vagal regulation of the heart. So the vibratory uh, sounds they're making actually stimulating functioning vagal activity as well. Wow. Okay, so then another one that I thought was uh, quite interesting um, is a question around dissociation. Um, and the question is, and this this is actually something that I feel like has come up uh, in a variety of ways, sort of um, whenever questions of trauma come up, which is, you know, there an argument could be made that certain meditative practices or approaches to meditation actually encourage dissociation. Yeah. Um, so when, when dissociation is a feature of, of you know, one's response to trauma, um, how do we, you know, leverage contemplative practices in a way that won't become dissociative? Well, you start understanding one of the cues that a traumatized nervous system takes to go into these uh, withdrawal, basically shut down responses. And also you have to have a, an appreciation that isolation, marginalization uh, is really uh, the major trigger of dissociation in most, I would say, it's a, it's a great, it's the most dangerous stimulus for a mammal is to be isolated or to be constrained. Yeah. And all the metaphors that go with that. And when you put a person in a room and they close their eyes or they start breathing and someone's behind them, they're by and they have a trauma history, they're going to go into a state of defense. Uh, and if they can't move, they may go into a state of shutting down, especially with eyes closed. So if you want to get people into contemplative, there are things that you could do uh, or titrate a person into, and that is put them against a wall. So they have the context of a wall for safety. They have containment. Um, have them do things with their eyes open. Do it with one one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, don't make direct eye contact. Be in kind of an angle or a parallel. 
So you don't create threat cues to the individual. Uh, give the individual homework to uh, do breathing exercises, not totally by themselves, but with a safe companion or friend. Because these big physiological state shifts, they may not be prepared to handle. So always, or someone holding their hand, or even doing a meditation where someone's hand is on their shoulder or something like that. A modification that keeps the person from dissociating, keeps them in contact. So, you know, when you were mentioning a moment ago, Stephen, about, um, I, I think I heard you, I, I'm, I heard you correctly when you said that being alone for mammals is traumatizing. Yeah. So then it's sort of interesting. It just kind of came up for me, this idea of like our cultural kind of val valuation of individualism. Do you see this kind of valuation as sort of like, it's almost like self-imposed trauma or like our whole, like our, our, well, let's kind of unpack it a little bit. So we talked about the penal system uh, and, and what it does as its greatest threat is to put someone in isolation. Mm -hmm. If you look at animal studies with, with mouse, small mammals, isolation is profound. It changes that. So when we're talking about isolation, we're talking about total isolation. Right. And we are in a society where we interact act in different ways. So a lot of people are interacting just as you and I were interacting on the internet. Now, it's not the same as face-to-face, -face, but it's better than nothing. And we use the phone, we use, or even texting. And the metaphor that I used, I used to use as sequence, I said with the telephone, we strip the face from, the voice from the face. But with the uh, internet and email and texting, we strip the word from the voice. And we could get along quite well just with voice. We don't get along that well just with text. So no, we, need, no. we need dynamic interaction because those dynamic interactions are neural exercises that support our bodily functions. So we can create complex narratives of why we need to be with people or why we don't need to be, people, be with people. But if we aren't using people in a proactive, positive way of co-regulating, then there are consequences to our own health. And in fact, we can even look at like the population of people on spectrum, autistic spectrum, and there's a higher prevalence of gut problems and all the things that we talked about earlier in our discussion in those individuals. And so, um, and then they started talking about like a trauma gut or an autistic gut, but there's an overlap and that is autistic individuals or tra traumatized individuals um, are not in a place in life where they can easily use other people to help them co-regulate. With autistic children, often the mother serves a very important role. And the mother is distinct from the father usually in those roles, not the eye of the parents, uh, selective love, but functionally by the voice of the mother. The mother's voice is safe to the child. The father's voice is too low a frequency. And through evolution, mammals have identified low frequency sounds as predator sounds. So mm -hmm. all, so that's why motherese or petties. And so I often say fathers are much better with their pets than their children because they'll talk to their pets in a petty ease or higher voice, but they won't talk that way to the children once the child's over six months old or something. But, yeah. And it almost, it almost uh, you know, what you're saying almost seems like an, a good reason for a more matriarchal society, just the ways in which the, the low frequency voices from men contributes to a sense of or, defensiveness, perhaps. Or we could be an informed society and learn to modulate our voice in different settings, talk a little higher with a little more melodic aspect. But in yeah. general, the, those features come out spontaneously uh, when we want to socially communicate. So in the patriarchal world of rain, often the males have, have, through the culture, try to express dominance, which forces the voice to be lower and less modulated. So they're barking as opposed yeah. to communicating. Right, exactly. 
All right. Well, we're getting near the end of our conversation, and this has been fascinating once again, Stephen. Um, but I'm wondering if you think there's any kind of areas um, related to polyvagal theory and trauma that we haven't covered on that perhaps we should touch upon. So what I'm working on now is trying to sketch models in which polyvagal theory can inform other therapies. So not that yes. polyvagal theory becomes a therapy, but it can inform other therapies. And it goes with certain principles of respecting physiological state and understanding that the physiological state is projected in voice, facial expression, and even in posture. So that if we can basically educate therapists as well as uh, other people uh, of the features that are, are uh, part of being a social human being, then we can encourage uh, that dialogue occurring between therapist and client and client with other people in the world. Mm. Now, is this, is this, are, the, are there fully kind of new, new forms of therapy that are emerging as a result of this? Or is it more that other forms of therapy are being reshaped and reformatted and, and there, modified? There's both. So um, there's a book that I edited. It's a Norton book called Clinical Applications of Polyvagal Theory, The Emergence of Polyvagal Informed Therapies. It's co-edited with Deb Dana. And in, in this book, uh, uh, different types of different people from different disciplines, including veterinary medicine, neonatology, psychiatry, nursing, social work, uh, play therapy, uh, took polyvagal theory and embedded it in what they were doing. So it wasn't a polyvagal therapy, it was their therapy, but now polyvagal theory optimized what they were doing. And the only polyvagal uh, treatment, I developed one, which is what I call the safe and sound protocol. Yes, I was going to ask about that. It's a listening uh, uh, th therapy or intervention. And what it does is it has distilled signals of safety. And we're using, that's been extremely effective with children on spectrum, uh, stimulating spontaneous social behavior, uh, language development, and facial expression. When it got moved to the world of trauma, which is to me really an interesting uh, an important place to work, it started to have, let me use the term, uh, very interesting and unpredicted effects. So for some, they went through it and the finding and the response was wonderful. But in others, the cues of safety became triggers of trauma. Mm. And, and for them, uh, uh, it became important not to use this intervention independent of a trauma therapy. So people who are moving this therapy, using this safe and sound protocol with trauma therapies are accelerating the impact of the trauma therapy because what is able now is to uh, provide the client with an experience of a trigger and then the body can resolve it and then they can work on understanding what's going on. So it can be embedded in the treatment, but not as a treatment for itself. So the, the, the tech, what we've learned, and I've learned a lot of this, is that uh, when you're dealing with adults with complex trauma histories, to be very respectful of that history and very respectful of the impact of cues of safety, that cues of safety are not universally wanted, especially this is that negative bias that you brought up earlier. If you have a complex history of trauma, of severe trauma, those cues of safety are really saying to the body, I've been fooled once, I'm not going to be fooled again. Yeah. And the body now defends against that. But in a therapeutic treatment model, that's useful. You can now work with that. Yeah, wow. So when I was reading one of your articles, it was actually, and I don't know if you're officially affiliated with this, um, but it might be interesting to get your thoughts. It was some kind of tool or device um, that was, um, uh, that essentially you strapped onto your chest. I think it was like a UK organization or something. Strapped onto your chest and then it was over your heart space, the, the, the device, and it emitted apparently vibratory frequencies into your, you know, I said, it's not my book, <laughs> okay, but, not but I think that's called the pebble or something like that. I, I don't you know. It, it, is, it quack, is it quackery? I, or? Uh, well, what I was told, since I haven't touched it, but someone has described it to me, 
it was creating a breathing frequency. So it vibrates and it gets you to breathe. Uh, so it, if you think of it as a, rather than emitting energies, all the, think of it as an aid that would get you to breathe in a rhythm that would, in a sense, calm you down. You can see the benefits of it. Right. But I don't know very much about it. Okay, okay. All right, so this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen, for talking with me today. Is, is there anything that you'd like to uh, share before we close, maybe things that are coming up for you or um, anything you'd like to share with the audience? Well, there are two things. One is the book on clinical applications came out, uh, I guess, with, with about six months or eight months ago. And second, we're having our first uh, a gathering, as we're calling it, of the providers who are using the uh, safe and sound protocol. And this is going to be in Florida at the uh, uh, April 26th and 27th. And we're expecting 150 people to discuss a lot of the things that we've been talking about. And that is what are the trauma features on that. The actual uh, intervention, you can get more information about it by going to Integrated Listing Systems webpage and they will provide you with all the information. Excellent. Uh, okay. So thank you very much, Jacob. Yes, thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a, a pleasure. I've been here with uh, Dr. Stephen Porges talking about polyvagal theory and trauma. Thanks again for tuning into the online conference, Tracing Trauma.